Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I know it's been the last talk um, at, at the end of the day, a very long talk. So really appreciate your attention, but very excited to talk about Talbench and end-to-end -end benchmark for social networks. So just to give a little bit of background on who I am, what this work is about, and why I'm giving this talk here. So I am a rising third year PhD student in the RISE lab at UC Berkeley. I'm co-advised by Professor Sasha Krebs and Jan Stoika. And my research has focused on transaction processing for databases. So my most recent work was RAMPTAL, which provided uh, read-only transactions at large scale. It appeared in BLDB last year, where it won Best Industry Paper Award. And today, I'll be talking to you about TauBench, a new benchmark for social networks based on Meta's production workload. And this uh, work will appear in VLDB this year. And the reason I'm presenting this work is because I want to explore how TauBench can be useful for LDBC. So to start off, social networks are ubiquitous. There's a lot of them. There's billions of users on them, and uh, they're a very important application domain, as we've seen in the past decade. They're supported under the hood by large-scale do distributed data stores, of which they're also a range. Um, Tau is Facebook's uh, social graph data store. Manhattan is at Twitter, and there's a variety of other ones as well. However, social networking benchmarks are not as ubiquitous. As we began this work, we found there really was a lack of publicly available realistic workloads for this domain, which has made it difficult for developers to both understand the limits of existing systems, as well as test new features and mechanisms. Um, so we, want, we first asked the question, what are the properties that should be captured by workloads of a social network benchmark? And we boil these down to five crucial properties we felt um, were necessary. The first is that we feel they should be derived from production traces. To the best of our knowledge, only one of these exists. It's LinkBench from Meta, um, which was based on uh, production request traces and sought to accurately uh, emulate these workloads. Also, we should capture any transactional requirements because these are very important semantic for application developers, but can also have significant performance and scalability implications for the system. Uh, the workload should also express co-location constraints because sharding often is not just an implementation detail, but can reflect user intent, privacy constraints, and or regulatory compliance. We also thought about how these request distributions should be modeled, and we felt they should to be modeled without prescriptive, prescriptive query types. What we mean here is rather than encoding specific queries, we instead use probability distributions for adaptability and flexibility. Of course, there's a trade-off here. When you have specific query types, it's much easier to understand exactly what patterns you're seeing, but if you have thousands or tens of thousands of query types running on a system, it's very hard to and code all of these in, uh, individually with code. And finally, we should capture the behavior of multiple tenants because social networks tend to be very large systems. You have many different applications as well as sometimes even layered infrastructure running on top. There is coordinated behavior which can have important uh, effects on the underlying system and should be captured in the workload. So looking at Existing benchmarks out there, LinkBench is a prominent one that I mentioned. So this was released in 2014 by Facebook, and it was actually derived from a partial production trace. So it excluded all the requests that hit cache because it only focused on a single MySQL instance underlying tau. Um, it didn't have any graph level transactions and also no information about sharding because it was just based on a single shard essentially. LDBC also has a social network benchmark, and this is a very important workload for graph databases. It has focused more on the processing intensive side rather than the serving side, and we're really interested in exploring how we can supplement this workload with TauBench. So uh, to give you a breakdown of the talk, I will go over the social networking production workload that we captured and how we made this into a benchmark and also present some results on different distributed databases we've run our benchmark on and the actual direct impact running a benchmark has had on these systems. So first, uh, I'll talk about the social network workload that we focused on uh, accurately simulating with our benchmark. 
So we derive our workload from Tau, which is Facebook's online social graph data store. Um, it underlies the majority of the family of applications at Meta. And as such, it runs at a huge scale. It's serving billions of queries per second. And because of this, it has a very simple API because it was designed to do a few things well at extremely large scale. It was uh, originally eventually consistent to provide high availability and low latency, but since has added read-only and write-only transactions, as well as read your write consistency. And at a high level, what it looks like is basically two graph-aware caches on top of statically sharded MySQL instances. So uh, Tau's workload satisfies all of the five properties we previously mentioned. So obviously, branding and production is actively serving billions of users. Um, it has uh, failure atomic write transactions, as well as having prototype read-only transactions. More info about that can be found in the RAMP crowd paper. Um, applications can choose to explicitly co-locate data in the MySQL layer or allow the system to choose where the data should be uh, placed. Furthermore, with uh, tens of thousands of query types per day, uh, it's very difficult to be able to replicate all these query types in the benchmark. So we really need the uh, probability distributions to model the full workload. And because there are many applications and uh, shared infrastructure running on top of Tau, we're able to see distinctive trends both uh, from single applications and across product groups that share the same infrastructure as well. Cool, so in terms of collecting data, what we did is we basically analyzed traces um, collected over three days. And the reason we chose three days is because we noticed that the most significant pattern was daily periodic periodicity. Um, however, the distribution didn't change significantly between three day periods. So we decided to aggregate over the days and um, we noticed like the skew and stuff didn't change even if the peak volume did, for example. We uniformly sampled over nodes and edges in the social graph and made sure to capture all requests that touched the items we were sampling to ensure that we didn't miss any conflicts on these keys. And conflicts are particularly important for transactions. Um, so overall, our trace was notably read heavy as expected of the social networking workload uh, consisting of reads, writes, and write transactions. So now I will go over a couple of interesting findings from our workload characterization. More insights can be found in our paper. Um, this is sort of just a preview to give a sense of uh, yeah, some interesting points in the workload. So one thing we found was that while social networks are known to be very skewed, uh, the read and write skew we observed actually occurred on different keys. So um, what I'm showing here is basically the read and write frequency per day for the top 400,000 uh, write keys for the like a sock. Basically, when you like something on Facebook, this corresponds to a data item shown here. So each point is a data item. And what we find is that there is a clustering of keys that are read infrequently or written to quite frequently. These can involve like asynchronous background tasks or data migration explaining why there's like many more writes than reads. On the other hand, there are also keys that are written to frequently and read frequently as well. And this could, for example, be a post by celebrity. So it like, gets a lot of likes and is viewed also very frequently. Another interesting finding we had is that um, some transactions can involve many items. So here I'm showing the breakdown of write transactions uh, both by the number of operations as well as the number of distinct shards touched. And you can see that I can get up to 100 operations on over 50 shards. And um, most of these, most of the larger ones especially are undergoing optimized protocol, which is described in RampTau um, to not affect non-transactional requests, but it shows sort of the diversity of the workload and the challenges of supporting, especially very large transactions when you have like billions of reads also going on in the system. We also looked at contention in detail. So, um, and we found that transactional conflicts actually vary greatly for different application use cases. So what this graph is showing here, it's a CCDF of sort of the conflicts per day on key type. 
Uh, so key type is a proxy for a uh, different application use case. So basically each dot is a different um, application using transactions. And we're showing both write, read, and write, write conflicts. We don't have any read, write conflicts because there are currently no blocking reads on Tau. Um, and something interesting we found was that the vast majority of essentially write, write conflicts were actually due to intentionally racing writes. Basically meaning that the application would send multiple writes knowing that only one of them would succeed. And the reason they do this is, uh, I can give a quick example here. So there's an application and it wants to sort of generate edges for live video time slices. And it wants to make sure that these edges are in place by the time it needs to access them. So sort of send multiple requests and rely on the system to ensure anonymity and guarantee only one of these edges will be created uh, per time slice. Yeah, so this is a brief overview. There's a lot more details in our paper, which um, will appear in VLDB. So with sort of our workload characterization, we identified a set of parameters that we showed to be sufficient to reliable reproduce these workloads. And they sort of fall into two categories, either pretty generalizable or unique to Tau, but the properties they're capturing are pretty important to any social graph, I would say. So more, the more general ones are like transaction size, sharding, operation type, is it read, or write, or a transaction, um, request sizes. In terms of unique to Tau, the later three are the ones that are a little bit more tied to the system. So association type here means there are certain constraints applied to edges, like whether it's unique, whether it's bidirectional, so it has like an inverse pair. Um, but these are sort of important properties in a lot of social graphs. And for preconditions, these are basically constraints placed on writes. So this write will only succeed if the version is at an X value. So it's generally used for like compare and swap functionality. And read tier is just indicates what tier um, the request is served by. So is it served by the cache or by the database? So with these parameters, we then created TauBench, a new benchmark for social networks. Um, so at a high level, our benchmark consists of scalable distributed drivers that can be easily extended to other systems. We take in several parameters. So the benchmark is taken like duration of the workload you want to run the target throughput as well as uh, the length of the warm-up period. And then for the workload, we specify the parameters we previously mentioned in a configuration file based on probability distributions. So these can be discrete, piecewise, linear, uniform, et cetera, distributions, depending on what workload you want to model. And this is taken in by the driver, which will first uh, generate an initial sort of baseline social graph in the data store, and then run the actual workload on this baseline graph. Um, our API is quite simple and it's based on Tau. Basically, you have read and write as well as read and write transactions. And optionally, they could be preconditions on the write and write transactions. And we found that this API is actually very easy to map uh, to other systems. We currently have support for MySQL and Postgres and also adapters for a bunch of other distributed SQL databases. For workloads, we have open sourced three workloads currently and are hoping to extend that as well. So we have first T, workload T, the current transactional workload, basically capturing all requests that go to keys that currently are accessed by transactions on top. We also have uh, workload A, the application workload, which is a speculative transactional workload that captures long-term transactional boundaries we want to support. So requests that are currently sent in parallel but are not yet under the transactional API. And finally, we have workload O, which is the overall workload, and it's a comprehensive uh, Tau workload that's notably read heavy. So I'll go briefly now over how we validated the integrity of the workloads that our benchmark was ge generating and ensured that the parameters we were using were sufficient to reproduce the characteristics we cared about. So in our validation process, we focused on latency and contention. We chose to use these two features because they uh, come from interactions between the workload and the system. A lot of the other parameters like transaction size, for example, we were already matching by construction because we we're giving those as input into the benchmark. Um, and contention in particular is really important for transactional workloads. So we found that the latency distributions we 
produced from our generated workloads were statistically identical to their production counterparts. And we also found that their contention errors for both uh, workloads to match. So this graph here is sort of showing the latency distribution breakdown for two different workloads and the production counterparts in blue and the ones generated by our benchmarks are in red and green respectively. And um, this is just like a visual, but we also did use statistical tests to ensure that they uh, were not different. So um, with this benchmark, um, we were really excited to see how it could be used on other systems and how it could be helpful to the wider database community. So now I will talk about how, what we've run to have a ton of results from those and the impact of our benchmark so far. So we evaluated Talbench on five distri different distributed uh, databases. So Cloud Spanner, which is Google's SQL database, CockroachDB is also um, a well-known commercial database that's open source. Uh, PlanetScale is a sharded MySQL database based on the test. And um, TIDB is a HTAP database from PinCap, also open source. And Yugabyte, which is a up and coming cloud database um, that supports SQL. Uh, we chose these five because they were they offered sort of like geo distributed SQL functionality and um, are targeted towards OLTP workloads. So, in terms of evaluation, we aimed for um, core parity if possible, cost parity if not. So, we basically allocated 48 cores for hosted cloud clusters in a single region for each of the systems, except for Spanner, which does not publicly give the number of cores per node. So, we use the six node cluster uh, by using price as the basis to choose the number of nodes from. And we received extensive tuning assistance from all the companies except, except Spanner for this effort. So um, we ran workload A, which is the more write transaction heavy workload, as well as workload O, which is more read heavy. And I will go through these results in detail, but here we're basically showing latency uh, over throughput for read, write, read transactions and write transactions. So the first thing to note is that we do see much higher throughput on workload O, which is expected because this workload is much more read heavy um, and there's like less contention because there are fewer transactions. We also found that we're able to elucidate performance differences on the same system with our workload. So we found that write transaction latency was higher on workload A, uh, that compared to workload O. While explaining these differences are out of scope for this particular work, it demonstrates that our benchmark is able to be useful as a tool to explore different aspects of the system. We also found that performance degradation varies across the system. So you'll first spanner, you'll see that latency uh, stays pretty much the same until you push the system past um, sort of you're using like all your all the CPU in the system. So then latency will like spike versus for planet scale, as you add more load to the system, the latency gradually increases. Uh, again, we're not trying to like compare the various systems here, but we're just trying to show that our benchmark is able to demonstrate different differences on these systems and can be used as a comparative tool. Um, I'll also describe the system impact we've had with our benchmark. So uh, there are more details in the paper, but I'll talk about some bugs we were defined for UITB as well as optimization opportunities. So when we first ran this benchmark uh, on this system, the performance is actually slower. So it's quite slow and we felt like there might be some issues with their systems and we basically worked with the engineers, we ran the benchmark for them and using our benchmark, and they found a bottleneck with a Postgres monitoring extension that was using exclusive locks and were able to um, fix this bug and we saw much higher performance on their system uh, after this fix. We also identified an optimization for scans. So we noticed out of memory errors when we were running Talbench initially, we run scans during our loading phase and this led us to help the engineers discover that 
they weren't pushing down filters for scans to Postgres. So anytime you wanted to like scan a certain amount of rows from a table, they were actually materializing the entire table into memory. Um, that has since been fixed and we've seen much better performance on these queries and um, this functionality is also generally available now. So in conclusion, I've presented a new benchmark, TauBench, which satisfies the five important properties that we identified for social network benchmark workloads. And I'm really interested to put open the discussion for how TauBench can be useful to LDBC. And um, you can reach me here, but also happy to take any questions now. And yeah, thank you. Thanks, Audrey. Any questions from the room? Seems everyone is now eyeing the coffee break. Uh, let me go through a chat. Oh, there are a few questions. Peter. Oh, is that a real question? Nope. Oh, okay. Thanks, uh, Audrey, for the for the nice um, benchmark. So, uh, Yuga Bench, is that uh, where does that come from? Actually, I don't know this system. Um, they're a relatively new startup. Uh, I think they're found like 2017, um, based in the US. Yeah, oh, okay. a cloud database startup. Mm. Yes. So yeah, indeed, I think these uh, these this is like complementary. I would say because because the the, the query workload that your um, that both link banks bench and tau bench do. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it is really like a short reach, isn't it? Like a single uh, and write and the, the queries are basically key lookups. Isn't, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. The vast majority of the workload is like point reads. Point, point queries, okay. Yeah. Okay, um, that's it. Okay, any more questions in the room? Yes, I'm from Bailey. Uh, uh, maybe I missed something. Um, this is social uh, network benchmark and the, the queries are like point read and write. Uh, can you connect this to like why the patterns are like that? Yeah, so um, I think part of it is like the API of Tau. Tau is very similar to like a key value data store. So when requests are sent to Tau, most of them are sent as like single reads. At the application level, there might be additional logic um, over the read results you've returned. But because of how the system has been designed and this uh, design can also be found like HBase for Pinterest um, where you have like a key value API, it's much more common to have mostly point reads. There are like scans um, and some range queries, but those are much more limited. It's mostly like single reads to the database. I see, thanks. Okay, thanks very much again for the talk. And yeah, thank you thanks everyone for attending the TUC.